and welcome to COM42Cast episode 5, Galactic Bees. My name is Miko Pavlikovsky and today with me our guest Charity Majors, the co-founder and CTO at Honeycomb. Charity, really glad to have you here today. How are you doing? Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. We're starting this little tradition that we start every guest off now with the same question. If you could have any animal at all as your pet, what would it be? <laughs> I think it would have to be a monkey. I, they're just, they're so clever and always getting into trouble. And, and I have a soft spot for creatures like that. Well, that's a great answer. Do you have any specific kind of monkey or any monkey will do? A small one, I think. The big ones are just too hard to keep. I mean, they eat a lot and they're big and rawr. But so something that I could physically overpower, I think, would be a necessity. You don't want them to be bigger or smarter than you are. I like that. Would it be a chaos monkey, do you think? Or yeah. just a regular monkey? <laughs> I mean, is there any such thing as a non-chaos monkey? <laughs> that's probably true. So I've been following Honeycomb for a while, you know, we're probably going to get into that. But one of the first things that I did notice when I was, you know, scanning your LinkedIn before you got here is that you actually hold a few patents. Can you yeah. talk about that a little bit? That's pretty amazing. Sure. Like, that sounds really, uh, really serious. They're mostly bullshit, honestly. <laughs> um, I mean, I think one of them is for like, <laughs> it's almost embarrassing. One of them was for like, running JavaScript remotely in the cloud, I think. Um, <laughs> it happens when you work at early startups where, you know, there's pressure from the VCs to have IP, like intellectual property, so that the company becomes more valuable and stuff, so that people patent things. There is one that I'm, I'm, I'm kind of proud of, though, which is the one that we got at Honeycomb. And first of all, like I don't believe in software patents, full stop. I, I just don't. I think that they're an abomination. But it's kind of one of those things where if everyone else is doing it, you have to too or else you get fucked. And I am kind of proud of the one that we made at Honeycomb. So it's, it's basically for like a hybrid between on-prem and, and cloud, right? Because yeah. you want your data to be inside of your private network, but you still want the convenience of having somebody else take care of it in the cloud. And so what we did is we, we made this, this proxy where you can run the proxy inside your secure network, stream your events through it. We compute the, and store the hash and map it to the raw event and only forward the hash to Honeycomb. The result is that you get your data, it never leaves your premises. Yet, when the JavaScript in your browser connects to Honeycomb, like we store all the hashes, so you can slice and dice and you can do all the normal things that you would, but then when you get the response, your browser knows to look up the raw event from the proxy. So it feels like a cloud service, but your data never leaves your premises. So it's kind of cool. Yeah, it does sound like it. So you basically tokenize it before sending it so that it never leaves the original file. Right. So the, how does it feel to be like a patent holder? Do you like, you know, feel good yeah. when you wake up about that? <laughs> well, the most ridiculous thing is at Facebook, they gave us these these very serious, um, like, engraved patent wow. lamps. And a friend of mine took it, just bedazzled it, and made it ridiculous. So I kind of love that. <laughs> okay, I want one of this on my desk now. Yeah. I know, right? <laughs> Everyone should have ridiculously, like, bedazzled patent lamp. <laughs> okay, one more thing that I did notice is that you've done a, like a fair amount of, you know, all this infra stuff. And I work with infrastructure quite a lot myself and I share the pain. <laughs> so how did you end up starting Honeycomb? What was the moment you felt like, okay, we need to do that? I mean, like everything else in my life, it came from pure rage. <laughs> it was... <laughs> It was bored for many, 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 many nights of getting woken up in the middle of the night in sorrow. I was the first infrastructure engineer at Pars, and it was going down constantly, you know? Like, it's a multi-tenant platform, right? We had over yeah. a million apps running on it by the time I left, which means one of them hits the iTunes top 10 or whatever, and everything goes down because we're using, like, a single pool for workers, a single database. You know, when something gets slow, everything gets slow. Yeah. And it's like a chicken and egg problem, right? It's like, well, what's slow? Well, everything's slow because it's all waiting on the same lock, right? So, like, I tried every tool out there and just nothing helped. This meant that I was just throwing bodies at the flames, including my own. And then there was one tool that finally helped us get a handle on things. It was called Scuba. It was this 
butt ugly, just aggressively hostile to users. It was not fun to use at all. But it did one thing really well, which is it let you slice and dice in near real time dimensions that were very high cardinality. Then you could break down by, you know, one in a million users yeah. and then break down by endpoint, you know, and it was just mind blowing to me that suddenly like these problems that had taken us days to figure out were like seconds, you know, not even minutes. Like it wasn't even an engineering problem anymore. It was a support problem. And that made a really big impression on me because <laughs> suddenly I wasn't getting woken up anymore. And so when I left Facebook, it was like, well, I wasn't planning on starting a company. I really hate the whole like founder industrial complex. Um, but some people were like offering me money and I realized that going back to living without this tool, would I would be so much less powerful as an engineer. And, and I didn't like that. So that's a nice origin it. story i gotta say sounds like something from a comic <laughs> book <laughs> rage <laughs> so honeycomb that started bk right before kubernetes i mean BK. or roughly <laughs> was it no it wasn't before kubernetes but it was before before sane people were running kubernetes <laughs> gotcha okay yeah so do you think like if you were to start it today for example with you know the kind of tooling that everybody gets with kubernetes and the entire ecosystem would it be a different story would you still oh go god no it? it made it kubernetes made everything 10 times worse <laughs> <laughs> 10 times more necessary i should say the problem of cardinality is is one you know and when i say high cardinality for if anyone listening doesn't understand it's like imagine you have a collection of like 100 million users and the highest possible cardinality would be like any unique id like your social security number or or a random request ID, first name and last name are lower than unique, but still high, very high cardinality. But gender is very low cardinality, and species equals human would be very, very low cardinality. The information that is the most useful for debugging is usually the high cardinality stuff, because if you could pinpoint it to a single pod or a single process or a single build ID, yeah. then that tells you something interesting. But most tools out there are built for low cardinality stuff. And back in the days when we had just the app server and the database, most problems could be debugged using just low cardinality tools, right? Because if all else failed, you would attach a debugger and just start stepping through the code. Now that we have microservices and everything, even the service name is a high cardinality dimension, let alone, you know, everything's gotten smaller and more of them, which is very well ill adapted to the last generation of tooling. So it made everything worse, but I guess it brought more business to you guys, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, very much. I don't know if that's a secret, but is most of your clients now kind of Kubernetes-based stuff, or is it um, kind of a mix? It's a mix of everything. I would say that most of our customers are doing microservices in some form or another. For good reasons or just fashion reasons? Yeah, <laughs> I plead the fifth. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough, okay. A smooth transition. Can you tell me one situation that you would like to share about some funny or interesting or haunting outage that you can describe that oh, you like, you know, telling people about anything particular that springs to mind? Oh gosh. Out of all of the outages that have come before. You're number one. <laughs> Most of my war stories for the past many years involved MongoDB because we were growing up with it at the same time as it was becoming a real database. You mean before it went web scale? <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, yes, <laughs> before it went web scale, exactly. But I think that one of my favorite outages would have to be the last time in my life that I ever had to call a cab at 2 a.m. and go down to the colo and flip the power switch at, at 2 a.m. That was a glorious moment and, and I will never repeat it because <laughs> now we have AWS to do this for us and, and the world is a better place. I was talking to some kid the other day who was complaining about the cloud and AWS. No, it's so complicated and all this stuff. Why should anybody use it? And I was just like, have you ever driven to the colo in the middle of the night? No, then you don't get to have an opinion. <laughs> <laughs> the rite of passage. You should do it at least exactly. once to appreciate exactly. it. Exactly. Exactly. We walked uphill in the in this in the snow barefoot both ways to get to to <laughs> our power. <laughs> Yeah, speaking of which, of uh, AWS, I, I watched Shelby Stuck on Graviton 2 and sounded like you made AWS run out of hardware. Is that, did they <laughs> give you a badge for that? Did you get like another trophy that you can put in oh, your... Oh, <laughs> I wish, I wish. 
Yeah, that sounds like an achievement. I guess that gets you extra points. But I quite like the transparency that gets point in my book too. One thing that I also noticed there is a definitely a pattern is that everything was named after a species of a dog. Yeah. You have a thing for yeah. dogs. Retriever. No, I don't. My co-founder does. Okay, so that's the story. Everything yeah. shall be named Chihuahua. Is that how it works? <laughs> no, it's like the, the database is named Retriever and the front end is named Poodle and, you know, the proxy thing is named Basenji. There's just a lot of dog lovers at the office. I'm dog agnostic. They're a little needy for my tastes, but they're fine. <laughs> the other reason we have dog names is because the company was originally named Hound or Bloodhound, oh. then we quickly shortened it to Hound. And then we got a cease and desist from Hound CI. So that's how we became named Honeycomb. <laughs> that's that's great. We were actually thinking about naming the episode something with puppies, but then, you know, you didn't mention any puppies on your website, so I wasn't sure <laughs> if it was like an official thing. I guess that explains why you have no it's mention of any dogs on the website. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. One other thing I wrote down is the mean time to WTF. Did you come up with that or is that someone else's? Because I'm totally still in there. I don't remember. <laughs> I say shit all the time and people quote me and I'm like, I said that? Okay, that's fine. What about observability? I think you define it on your website, but can you give me your take? Because it's kind of like one of those things that I really liked the word. And then it kind of becomes like a <laughs> buzzword now. Yeah, it's really unfortunate. I will take some blame for the fact that it is a buzzword. Nobody was using the word when we got started. And I was looking for a way to differentiate what we were doing from monitoring, right? Because I've got mad respect for monitoring. You know, everybody should do some monitoring. But it wasn't what we were doing, right? When I googled the definition of observability, which comes from mechanical engineering, it's like the mathematical dual of controllability is observability. And, and it has to do with, can you understand what's happening inside the system, any state that it's gotten itself into, just by asking questions from the outside. And that's when I, I had light bulbs going up. I'm like, oh my god, this is exactly what we're trying to do. The last generation of tools you know, that's built on metrics is all about dashboards, which are just like these artifacts of past failures. Every time you try to bug, it's just littered with dashboards, right? And then you've got people that are just like, scanning the dashboards and trying to jump to conclusions and then go look for evidence that they're right. But like with observability, it, it's about unknown unknowns, right? If monitoring is about known unknowns, observability is about unknown unknowns. And so it's about, does the tool set that you have allow you to interrogate that state so that you can start with no prior knowledge and without shipping any custom code to handle that state, understand the state. And, and if you accept that definition, then there are a bunch of technical prerequisites that you need. You need to be able to handle high cardinality, you need to be able to handle high dimensionality. Any sort of indexing is like out, right? Any sort of like schemas are out because they all involve predicting what kind of data you're going to see and, and what kind of questions you're going to need to ask. I feel like, you know, we started talking about these problems and, and these solutions and suddenly everybody was like, that sounds great. We do that too. And it's like, no, you don't. <laughs> There's the technical definition here. I would love it if you did meet the technical definition, but you don't. And so I feel like there's been a lot of froth in, in the in the environment over the past couple of years because everybody's just like, yeah, 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 it's just another synonym for telemetry, right? And it's like, no, that wasn't really the point of it. There's a technical definition. And it, it behooves us to be clear on this point because there are lots of things that, you know, monitoring and metrics tools are great at. There are different things that observability tools are great at. And the best practices that you need are very different. Like, for example, a classic monitoring best practices, you shouldn't have to look at the dashboards all day. The system should inform you when when something's wrong so that you go look at it. Whereas with observability, it's much more about being in a constant conversation with your code and looking at the graphs every time you ship more new code and comparing it, doing what I wanted it to do, like through the lens of, of the instrumentation that you just wrote. Is it doing what you expected? Does anything else look weird, right? That's a much more active and, and constant like engaging with the graphs than, than just the sort of like, has it reached a threshold that somebody should get paged, right? That makes a lot of sense. I don't know if you've heard, but there's a new kid on the block now. There is the understandability. That's the all the rage now. Oh, Are you really? Going to rebrand now? <laughs> no. I think it's nope. kind of like observability with the, you know, additional <laughs> layer of actually understanding what you're observing. Uh, this is what's so frustrating because if you have the right tools and you look at your sh 
it. You will understand it. <laughs> and if you don't, and you don't, you won't. And yeah, it's, it's frustrating. I feel like we're kind of like circling in. I understand, you know, you have Humio, you have Lux, you have some dashboards, you made some Prometheus dashboards. What is like the secret sauce now that turns this data into observability in, in the way that Honeycomb does it? First of all, Prometheus is a metrics-based tool. It's a monitoring tool. The source of truth for observability, the data format, is these arbitrarily wide structured data blobs. You gather your telemetry in one of those wide events per request per service. One way to think about this is when we blew up the monolith, we lost the ability to step through our code because every time you hop the network, you discard all that context. So by bundling up your telemetry this way, one arbitrarily wide structured data blob per request per service, you're actually shipping that context around with the request as it hops around. You can derive metrics from the arbitrarily wide structured data blobs. You can derive logs from them. You can derive traces from them. You can't go in the other direction. You can't take a Prometheus and get observability out of it. You can take an observability tool and get Prometheus data out of it, but it doesn't go in the other direction. Trying to jam on these old tools, you can't get observability out of them. You have to start with the right data format. That makes sense. Question, I might be a little bit biased, but how do you see like chaos engineering in fitting into all of that? Is that something that helps you with the observability? I see chaos engineering as being like, there's been a massive shift in the landscape in the past. You know, it used to be that we we're sinking all of our energy and all of our developer cycles into pre-production hardening and all of these staging environments and all of this blah, blah, blah. And I think that we reached some diminishing returns to say the least. And, and I think over the past five years, you've seen a lot of little startups like us and Launch Darkly and Gremlin and stuff. The focus is, you know, shining a light on hardening your production systems themselves and on instrumenting and tooling and, and just like gaining visibility and understanding, <laughs> understandability, <laughs> right, of your production systems. And I think chaos engineering is part of that. I think that, you know, if you're just throwing chaos engineering at your systems and you don't have observability, then, then I would argue that you just have chaos. You should be able to see what you're doing before you go and start adding more of it. But I think that all of these trends are good. I think that they're all necessary. I think that we have really ignored production for too long when it comes to where we spend our tooling and our, and our time. And I think part of the fact that we stopped ignoring is also because, you know, the SRE and all this kind of ecosystem and the cool factor kind of also made it possible to say, oh, you know, I work on basic operations and it's fine. <laughs> and I have a cool company around there. Tell me, what do you think would be like the main technologies or methodologies? What would you look out in tech for the next few years? You know, what's the next step now, logically, after observability? You say that as though anyone's gotten there yet. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe there have an answer. Very, you know, it was worth a there try. Are, <laughs> there are very few companies who have achieved any kind of observability out there. And part of that is because of all the muddying of the waters. Part of that is because it's hard to change. It's hard to learn new things. And I don't honestly think that you can ask someone to learn a new tool, change the way they do things, unless what you're offering them is an order of magnitude better than what they have. And I think that it's really just in the last couple of years that we can finally say that, yeah, actually, you know, this tooling has gotten mature enough that it's pretty drop in. It's not in the bleeding edge anymore. It's going to help more than it hurts, you know, certainly to like an order of magnitude. That's definitely true, but it's always nice to have like a little thing to look out for, put on your radar. There must be something that you can name drop here. Is it eBPF? <laughs> 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 I don't know, dude. I'm an ops. You know how much we hate new things. <laughs> I don't even like to upgrade apps on my phone. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So a little bit more of a personal question. Um, if you had like a kid come to you and say, okay, hey, what should I do if I wanted to be kind of like you when I grow up? What would you tell them? Oh, Jesus, don't. You seem to have been blessed with a lot of different weird systems and defining observability. That sounds like a lot of fun, doesn't it? Honestly, starting a company is the most painful, awful thing I've ever done, and I don't recommend it. It's gotten better, but the first four years were grim. Uh, is it fun? I guess. Uh, it's fun in retrospect. I, I, think, I think that I mostly experience fun retroactively when I'm like, yeah, that was worth doing, you know? But I tend to lean into pain, I guess, a lot. 
All right. One last question, kind of to give our audience a little bit to take home. What would you say is like a single highest return on investment thing or activity that you did for your career? It could be an object or a mm. course or a whatever it is. The single biggest thing that I did for my career was learning to speak in public. I was not born with the ability to speak and think at the same time. And like I I gave my first talk, it was like a 10 minute talk at reInvent in 2015 and it was humiliating. Like I couldn't, I was so terrified. I printed out every word that I wanted to say because I, I couldn't, I knew I couldn't remember anything if there were people staring at me. And it was so humiliating that I went home and I was like, that could never happen again. Uh, and so I submitted talks to like every conference that I could. And I, I, I started giving talks like one or two a month for the next three or four years. I got a prescription from my doctor for anti-anxiety medication. This blood pressure, it blocks adrenaline receptors in your brain so that you don't shake from the nervousness. Because I, I, I would have nightmares for months before each talk. So it was intensely mm-hmm. awful. But about a year and a half after giving talks every every couple of weeks, I started forgetting to bring my prescription with me. And that's when I was like, aha, I have cured my fear of talking in public. I just, I don't see how I could have done anything like doing this podcast or pitching for money or any of that stuff. It just wouldn't have been possible if I hadn't overcome my fear of speaking in public. Wow, I can totally relate. I, I remember my first time, Jesus Christ, my hands were so sweaty. Fortunately, yeah. not many people came to my talk, so that helped. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> also, yeah. w- w- when you mentioned prescription, I thought you were going to say that the doctor prescribed you public speaking to, you know, overcome <laughs> your fears. I was like, oh, wow, that's, no, that's no. a lot <laughs> Uh, propranolol is what it's called. If any of the kids out there want to go ask your doctor for some drugs, it'll help you get over fear of public speaking. It's called propranolol. Okay, I guess we should add at the end, this is not medical advice, seek <laughs> professional help if you need any of that. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard quite a few people actually say that the increase in just stamina for speaking in uncertain situations has really had a massive um, you know, effect on their yeah. careers and the trajectory. So yeah. yeah, I think that's really good advice. That's really cool. Okay, this was really lovely. I've really yeah, enjoyed talking funny. to you. I think I've learned quite a bit. Would you like to tell our viewers now who might have heard about Honeycomb for the first time how to go and get started, where to go and what to do? We're on the internet at honeycomb.io. <laughs> we have a really cool blog where we talk a lot about not just Honeycomb stuff, but like how to instrument your code, how to think about observability, how to kind of like transform from the old up and down, like monitoring sort of way to a more modern, you know, way of thinking about your systems. Also, Honeycomb.io on Twitter, um, or you can find me, Mipsy Tipsy, on Twitter. And my blog is charity.wtf. Awesome. Don't forget about Shelby Stuck. Make sure you check that if you want to learn a lot of different names for different dogs. I definitely didn't know all of them. All right. Thank you so much. This has been a blast and uh, we'll see you next time.